Welcome to chapter 10 of OpenStax College Physics. And in this first lecture video, we are going to be introducing um, this new idea of angular acceleration, which means we'll have to remember some of our uh, circle ideas from chapter 6. And then we'll start to talk about how this angular acceleration can be used in problems that will look really similar and should feel really similar to chapter 2 kinematics problems, because we can do kinematics with rotation. So first of all, this slide uh, remind us, reminds us from a couple of these smaller definitional example um, or tools from chapter 6. So for the first one, r theta equals s, that is reminding us that the radius of a circle is the way that we can kind of go back and forth between angular distance and physical distance. Uh, we have the tangential speed, the regular kind of physical speed or velocity is the arc length s over the elapsed time t. We introduced back in chapter 6 this idea of angular speed or angular velocity, which is the angular distance theta divided by the elapsed time t. And we talked about the fact back in chapter 6 that um, the radius was the way to go back and forth between the angular velocity and the physical um, velocity. So on the left side of our slide, those are those um, four uh, key ideas that we introduced back in Chapter 6. We also want to remember that revolutions, degrees, and radians are all units for angle, but radians are the only one that are the standard units that we can use for theta when it's by itself in equations. It's the only way that our numbers actually work out is if we put theta into radian units. We have to be very careful about that. The way that we do for everything else, it's just that when we see miles in a problem, we know that we have to turn that into meters. We need to be just as comfortable and kind of clear-headed about when we see revolutions in a problem, we know we have to put it into radians. Or if we see degrees in a problem, and we're dealing with theta all by itself in equations, we have to put it into radians. We also talked about the time period t. That isn't something that's going to be as essential to us here in chapter 10, but I did want to remind us of it. So back in chapter 6, when we think about the type of problem that we dealt with, we were talking about objects going around in circles, and we weren't really worried about them speeding up or slowing down. We either asked at a particular instant in time what the um, speed, angular speed or physical speed was, uh, or we were talking about things moving at a constant speed as they changed direction. So we had back in chapter 6 this idea of centripetal acceleration that just came from the fact that the direction was changing. But here in chapter 10 we're going to talk about the fact that those objects can also speed up as they circle or slow down as they circle. So we can define a tangential acceleration that acts just the same way as the acceleration from chapter 2 the change in the tangential speed over the change in the um, time, or lapse time. And you'll see, or you'll notice, um, that here in chapter 10, and this happened in chapter 6 too, we're being a lot more flexible about the words speed and velocity kind of being back and forth almost the same. But that is because we are talking about the direction in all of these problems also. We are talking about going around in a circle. So the speed is how fast we are going, and going around in a circle is telling us about the direction, which is why we're able to kind of go back and forth with this idea of speed and velocity, something that is not um, as straightforward to do when we are talking about objects that change direction, um, like back and forth, or they make a sharp left turn, things like that, from back in chapters 3 and 4 and so on. So we're going to have this first introductory example. Um, we're not going to have a separate video for this. We're just going to do it on the whiteboard. And we're going to be looking at a car going around at a track. And it's kind of a rocket car. This is not a standard um, car. But um, it is speeding up at a constant rate. So the acceleration that we're going to get, we can just assume is the same constant acceleration in the whole problem. And we're told that we start at 24 meters per second and we end at 70 meters per second. And it takes us 20 seconds to do that. So let's draw out this picture. And I'll show it on the board in just a second. So we were going 
at some initial speed of 24 meters per second tangent to the circle. We went around possibly um, several times around the track, uh, possibly just part way around the track, but we do know that our final speed, no matter where it is along the circle, is 70 meters per second. We're also told that the radius of the circle is 800 meters. Okay, so before I plug any numbers in, this is just the initial picture. We have the initial velocity, the final velocity, the radius, and the fact that the elapsed time is 20 seconds. Okay. So for this first question, the tangential acceleration, that's the change in tangential speed or tangential velocity over the change in time. So the final is 70, the initial is 24. We didn't change direction, so they can both have a positive sign. And the um, elapsed time is 20 seconds. So the tangential acceleration here is 46 on top divided by 20 is 2.3 meters per second squared. Okay, so that first question is just, if we erase the picture entirely, this is still exactly the same format um, that we had back in chapter, the same format that we had back in chapter two, that we had a final velocity and initial velocity and then the lapse time. Works just the same way. But the second question on our slide here, the car's centripetal acceleration, reminds us that we have information from back in chapter six that we can use, where the centripetal acceleration is v squared over r. And so we think to ourselves, okay, which velocity do we use? Reread that question, it's asking the centripetal acceleration at t equals 20 seconds. So at that final velocity, we have 70 squared over the radius of 800. And we get 6.1 meters per second squared. Now, this quick introductory example points out a couple of key things for us. So first of all, there are two different numbers here because they are describing different things. In blue, the tangential acceleration exists because the car is speeding up. That would exist even if we were speeding up in a straight line. Um, and it's here because we aren't dr driving around in circles at a constant speed. The centripetal acceleration would be there even if we were driving around in circles at a constant speed, it exists because the direction that our car is facing is constantly changing. And so this is because we are speeding up and slowing down. This is because we are changing direction. It is possible to have both occur in a problem, but they will be different number values because they're describing different changes in the motion. All right. So this slide has a description of all of those. So centripetal acceleration is what an object has if it's circling because of that changing direction. The tangential acceleration that we've kind of introduced just before that example, but it isn't really new to us, it is the idea from chapter two of just acceleration, if we're speeding up or slowing down. And then we have one new, new idea um, that we're introducing here in chapter 10 that really is brand new, but probably not all that surprising. If we think about angular velocity changing, then we can think about that change over elapsed time being angular acceleration. So we're going to use the Greek letter alpha for this. So to be really clear, when we think about um, angular motion, compared to, uh, we'll call linear 
um, motion or regular motion. We have for the distance, um, the angular distance, we have theta. For the physical distance, we have x or s in um, chapters, uh, chapter 6. We already had the angular velocity, so we have a regular velocity. And then we have an angular acceleration, which is comparable to our regular acceleration. Now this angular acceleration is the change in omega over the change in time, the change in the um, angular velocity over the change in time, in the same way that regular acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. So there's nothing fundamentally new or different, it's just that there's this new quantity that we have to describe with a symbol, the Greek letter alpha, and units, radians per second squared. Radians, radians per second, and radians per second squared, because it's radians per second per second. It will be worth pausing the video or opening up the PDF slides and writing down this um, set of information. I'm not going to read it all out loud to you because you have access to the paused video or the slides themselves. Uh, but it's really important that we have all of this in our heads as we're doing problems here in Chapter 10 and eventually on um, quizzes and, and exams. So it reminds us what these letters are called, um, what they're used for, and what the units are supposed to be. All right, so another example for us to make sure we know how to use this new idea of, um, of alpha. Okay. So, we have a grinding wheel, and we are told that that grinding wheel is spinning at a rate of 200 radians per second. 200 radians per second the unit should tell us what this is. This is omega that we know from chapter six that we might not have used for a while, but we need to remember that those units tell us the information on what it is. And we're told that it has a brake applied to it so that the wheel stops in one minute. Okay, so this is the initial omega. We're told that the uh, um, wheel is slowing down. So I'm gonna use a different color to help us recognize this. It's slowing down, so alpha is going to be pointing in the opposite direction. Just like with regular car on a highway, if we point in the same direction with velocity and acceleration, we speed up. If they're pointing in opposite directions, we slow down. That's all we really need to put into our picture to make it clear to ourselves. We also have two other pieces of information in that statement. We're told that the wheel stops, and so the final omega is zero. That comes from the word stops, and we're told that it takes one minute. So 60 seconds have elapsed um, for this to happen. So we're asked to calculate the angular acceleration. Okay, so we have an equation for that, the change in omega over the change in time. That means omega final minus omega initial over the change in time. So zero minus 200 over 60. So we know that it's going to come out to be negative because it's opposite direction and if we look 0 minus 200 is going to ensure that negative number happens and so we get negative 3.33 radians per second squared. Oh I said it but I didn't type it or write it out. we get negative 3.33 radians per second squared. Okay, so that is gonna help us understand what that angular acceleration really is. And if we really do feel like we're struggling with it, try to see if you can take a step back and recognize the similarity with our understanding that we've been building since chapter two of regular acceleration, because this really isn't 
fundamentally different. It's just using different unit um, system. Okay, so if we think about these two different accelerations, the tangential acceleration that is really our chapter two idea and angular acceleration, which is our brand new chapter 10 idea, if we compare them, if we compare them, so we have that alpha equals the change in omega over the change in time. And we have that um, A tangential equals the change in velocity over the change in time. If we, um, if we look at these two and remember that we have R omega equals V, then we can see how if we multiply both sides by R here, so I'm going to multiply the left side by R and the right side by R. Then now what we have is that R omega and V, and there is a change here, but let's say that we start at rest. R omega and V means that um, this left side on both are equivalent to each other. So a kind of hand wavy derivation because I don't have as much board space or as much time in this format. But this is consistent with the other two comparisons that we had before, which are now all listed on the slide here, that um, Radius is really the conversion factor in a way between radian units and meters. It's the way that we go back and forth between the linear kind of quantity and the angular quantity. And this um, table here in our slide is similar to one that I had on the whiteboard briefly um, earlier. So this works for rolling objects too. So when we use the letter S for arc length, we can also mean the physical forward distance x if something is rolling. When we use the tangential speed v tangential, um, that's also just the regular forward speed v, and then the tangential acceleration is the same acceleration across the room. And so we can rewrite these. Um, the only difference between this slide and that one um, is that we now have x, v, and a to really hit home the comparison here. Okay, so if we think back to our um, regular chapter two kinematics equations, these are kind of the big three from that chapter. The position time equation on top, the velocity time equation in the middle here, and the velocity position equation, or more commonly the no time equation at the bottom. If we take any single one of these and we look at um, its form in words, so x minus x naught um, is displacement. So it's really here the displacement is equal to the initial velocity times time plus half of the acceleration times time squared. If we were to multiply every single term by r, then we would get angular displacement is equal to angular initial angular acceleration times time plus one half angular acceleration times time squared. So let's see briefly where that comes from, just so that we um, that we understand that these these equations do take exactly the same form. And I said. I apologize, I said that we would multiply every term by r, but what I meant was divide. So we can divide this by r and this whole side by r. But then what we get is x over r on the left. Oops. Is equal to x not over r. plus, 
So let's look at this part. V naught over R, and then the T is still here. And then the A over R, and then the T squared is still here as well. So if we look at this, X over R, and if we go back to the fact that R theta equals X, this is theta, X naught over R is theta naught, V naught over R is omega naught, plus one half alpha T squared. A over R is alpha. And so we get on the bottom here the same thing that's in the bottom of this slide. And it's not so much a derivation as it is just using that radius to be the conversion factor between these regular quantities and angular quantities. And so once we do that for one problem, or one equation rather, it becomes, um, it becomes very straightforward to do it for the others. I'm not going to use the whiteboard to do it for all of them because we always give you the equations. We just want to show you where they come from. But if you divide um, the radius the appropriate number of times for each term for the other two equations too, you will see that they work out to have this same kind of parallel between regular kinematics from chapter 2 and rotational kinematics from chapter um, 10 here. The key concept, and it's worth writing this down in big capital letters, highlighted notes um, for yourself, is that theta, omega, and alpha are new quantities for angular distance, angular velocity, angular um, acceleration, work just like x, v, and a from chapter 2. And once we convert one of them, it's simple to change over the rest. I'm not going to do that for you because we give you the equations um, necessary here. But the one thing I want to point out is this table from our own textbook. The only difference between what we're going to see and what this table has is that we, um, in this table, have set the initial position and the initial angular position to zero. If you think back to chapter 2 problems, um, x naught, our starting position for x, was almost always zero. This is just trying to simplify that and show um, if we do make that decision. That same thing is going to happen all of the time here in chapter 10, where our initial angular um, position, uh, theta um, initial, we will tend to set to zero. So this will lead us into example problems that all have their own um, videos. So try these on your own with the idea in mind that they are just like chapter two, um, but tune into those example videos to make sure that you understand how those similarities occur. So example 10a, we have a um, rotating turntable that is turned off, and so it slows down and stops. In example 10b here, we have a wheel that is moving at a certain rate, uh, rotating a certain rate, and then it speeds up to go faster, and we can figure out information about that. And then um, one thing I want to point out here is that if we think about regular chapter two problem, so a car going at 12 meters per second speeds up to 20 meters per second and it takes five seconds, we're asked to find the acceleration and the distance. I'm gonna put the answers up on the, um, on the slide, but I want us to think about the fact that if we pause the video and try this problem, it shouldn't feel overly complex. This is one of the early chapter two kind of problems that we talked about. For the acceleration, we can just use either the definition of acceleration or the velocity time equation. And for the distance traveled, we could actually use either of the other two equations because we have enough information at that point, but we would probably use the distance time equation. We're finding the position x at time t equals five seconds. And what we end up with is that the acceleration is 1.6 meters per second squared, and that the distance that we travel is 80 meters. Okay, straightforward chapter two problem. It might feel a little bit rusty. It's been a while since we did them, but it is something that's in our toolkit and has been for a while. 
The key thing here is that here in chapter 10, these same kind of problems have exactly the same kind of flow. So in this example, I use the same numbers, 12, 20, and 5, but we recognize that the units are different. This is at a wheel that is rotating instead of a car that is driving, but the numbers work out the exact same way using the same overall process. The angular acceleration is 1.6 still, but now that's radians per second squared, and the angular distance um, is now 80 radians instead of a physical distance of 80 meters. The point for this pair of examples, and they don't have their own um, video, you can kind of look at the solutions to make sure they make sense to you here. The main point for this pair of examples is that these rotational kinematics problems are not fundamentally different than chapter two. We don't spend a lot of time going over problem after problem after problem because we did all of that in chapter two. And this is just a chance for us to see the small change that happens when we're dealing with rotational quantities instead. So I will see you in the next video where we will talk about the rotational equivalent of mass. See you then.